msula.edu to invest in a Xavier student's future. Thank you for your support. Hey, I'm Keith Spira from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. My guest this week on Let's Talk with Keith Spira is singer-songwriter Paul Sanchez. Paul Sanchez, it's been over 30 years since you put out a record called Jet Black and Jealous and people still love this record. What was the secret of this record? I didn't try. <laughs> well, we will try to have a good interview. Tune in this week on Let's Talk. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Vojkovic family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. You've heard about rugby. The hard hits, the whole no pads thing, but rugby is more than that. It's this, a whole day, a whole culture. Well, the fans bring the energy, so we better bring it too. Set! Every play, every match, for the city we call home. This is rugby, and we are Nola Gold. Max Durbis Realtors has been providing commercial and industrial real estate services to its clients for nearly 100 years. Since 1934, Max Durbis has been locally owned and operated throughout the greater New Orleans area, including the North Shore, Hammond, and even the Mississippi Gulf Coast and beyond. We focus on your commercial real estate needs so you don't have to. More information is available at 504-733-4555. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. I cannot wait for this show. And one of the reasons is we have an Olympian. Yeah, we've had some before. Carl Malone was on the Dream Team, but we've got one going to Paris this, this fall. And I can't wait because she is a Pro Beach Volleyball player. Kristen Nuss, part of the great team with Taryn Cloth, and they are number two in the world right now. And they're young, young, just three years out of college, and they're gonna be in the Olympics. They're number one in the United States. So that's gonna happen. She's gonna be on the show. But let's get to basketball right off the bat, because last night we all saw it. UConn won their second straight title. That's only happened. Florida did it like, I don't know, in 2007, 17 years ago. Duke did it in 91, 92. Before that, it was UCLA in the early 70s, and they had a few in a row. But you UConn has put themselves in a status, and I'm going to tell you this, they've won six titles in the last 25 years. That's getting on dynasty status, so congrats to them. South Carolina in basketball, how about them? They've only lost one game in the last two years, and that was to Caitlin Clark's Iowa team last year. Well, Caitlin Clark, who's dynamite, they were up 21-5 to in this game. She's been great all year. Well, they played defense, and they knocked her out. She is gone, and South Carolina gets their second title in three years under Dawn Staley. They are a juggernaut. One loss in two seasons. That's crazy. Mm, speaking of women's basketball, <clears throat> they got one in our backyard that's one of the greatest of all time, Simone Augustus. She is now going to the Basketball Hall of Fame inductee 2024. She was the first overall pick in the draft to the Lynx, right? Well, LSU, here's your fun fact of the day. They're the only school in NCAA history that have the number one overall pick in four different major sports. NBA, it's Shaquille O'Neal. How about that? We also had Joe Burrow in the NFL just a few years ago. And last year, Paul Skeens was the overall number one. We had the one and two along with Dylan Cruz in the second pick. But they've also had Ben McDonald in the 80s. Remember Big Ben? At LSU, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated with the Orioles. They also had Ben Simmons with the number one overall pick. He was a rookie of the year with, uh, with Philly. And then you had Billy Cannon, Heisman Trophy winner in 1960. He was the number one overall pick. And also Jamarcus Russell 
who was a little bit of a bomb in the NFL. He was number one overall, and then a guy named Eric Ketzel. Moving forward, the Pelicans, hey, they finally got a win, a much needed one. They lost five of six at home, the drop from fourth down to seventh tied. So there you go. That's the remaining schedule. Four games starting tonight. They have four in the next six days. So hopefully they can get down to the six, maybe even five seed, and so do some damage. Also, it's going to be a great one because we also have, hey, by the way, the Masters is starting up this weekend. And then the Zurich Classic here in New Orleans will be here in two weeks. I cannot wait for that. That's going to be two weeks from now. It starts on the Thursday coming up. But I got a great, great show for you. We have a couple two-lane guys. The starting second baseman, Connor Rasmussen. And also, we're going to go talk about some business side of Tulane with my man, Justin Berger. So here, coming up there on Primetime Sports. See you then. Welcome back to Primetime Sports, and it was just a few weeks ago we had our first beach volleyball guest. That was just college. Now we're going to the big leagues, and we got some of the best in the entire world, not just the United States. They're the number one team from the United States, number two in the world, and we've got half of that team with us right here, and guess what? She's from New Orleans, Mount Carmel High School, uh, St. Dominic, or what was it, St. Dominic? St. Dominic. <laughs> and then, mm. then to LSU, and they put LSU on the map. Her name is Kristen Nuss, her partner is from South Dakota, believe it or not, and she is Taryn Cloth. And here we are right now. Welcome to the show. And yeah, welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate I, it. I got to finish doing some intros because I didn't give you justice. Um, you're the MVP of the entire AVP League, the Association of Volleyball Professionals, which is unbelievable. Let me tell you all real quick. I went back in 2007 and I watched that league and it was unbelievable. I went for a few weeks with my friend Dave Stokes. He lived in Colorado, he still does, and he trained some of the girls that were like the top ones in the uh, whole event. Um, and I gotta tell you, I got hooked. And you know, the men and the women play at the same time. It's not like women's basketball where they don't play, you know, the same venue the same day. It's all together and it's a great event. And if you ever go, you'll, you'll see the same thing. But this group right here, I'm talking about, this is only their fourth year, really their third and a half. And Taryn, who's not here right now, she's six foot four. She is the offensive player of the year in the whole league. I'm talking about this is a world. This is in the United States. And Kristen right here is the MVP of the entire league and the defensive player of the year. So I got that out of the way. And now they're going to the Olympics to represent the United States and they'll be the number one team going over there. There's a Brazilian squad that is number one in the world right now. So we'll see if they can take gold, whatever they place, or if they don't, they're going to represent the United States and the girls from New Orleans. So there's your, there's your intro. Wow, I appreciate that. You crushed that. That was amazing. I was yeah. an agent at one time. I'm a little out of practice, so I like talking about others. So No, that was good. And I'm glad you got to see an AVP event. I feel like so many people, they go to an event, and they're like, what is this? is amazing. And they keep coming back. So the more people That's how it get happens. to events, yeah. I've been the one in New Orleans when I moved back. I was in Atlanta before that, and I saw... I didn't live too far from where that event is, if it's still in, in the same place in Mid Midtown. But it's just so much fun to get out there. What got you into the beach side of it? Because I know, I don't know when you grew up, the beach is as big as it is now. I'm sure it was getting there. It definitely was not. I mean, when I was still playing juniors, we were struggling to find teams to just make a tournament. We, we were struggling. And now juniors events at White Sands, at Coconut Beach, there's so many teams that are out there playing. The tournaments get sold out, which is so nice. So, yeah, when I was playing, beach volleyball was not very popular. But I did play indoor volleyball. Sure, which is six, uh, right? Yes, six on six, six which on is six. what we all kind of grew up with yep. for over a certain age, like myself. I just remember the first time I saw the two-on-twos, and Karch Karai, who's like the legend in this business, I mean, if you're talking about somebody that did it back in the 80s, oh, yeah. maybe even the 70s, I saw him, he was still, he was at the end of his career, but he was still great. But the athleticism, they had some ex-basketball ex players, they had one from Florida, uh, Dalman or something like that, his name yeah. escapes me. On the, the six foot nine on the men's side. But right, right now there's a Chase Buttinger. He used to Chase play. Chase Buttinger from uh, Arizona. Yeah, he used to play basketball. And he was a first round pick in the NBA. Yeah. I know Chase yeah. well. Um, but the league is exploding. And, and when I was going to the event back in 07, it was Shaq's agent at the time who had, he had left Shaq. And Shaq mm -hmm. had got another agent. He was the, the uh, chairman, what do you call it, the, the guy that runs the league. Yeah, probably the CEO or... The, the guy that ran the league, and he, I thought he did some great things. He had some great sponsorships, but to see this explode and see how it's, far it's come, the Americans were dominating most of the Olympics since they put it in probably about 30 years ago. Uh, Christy 
Christy Walsh, or Carrie, Carrie Walsh, Walsh and Misty May. And Misty yep. May trainer, they won three straight. So when you go to the Olympics and you see the history of this, and that starts in a few months, um, what are your thoughts that you're, you're going to the Olympics? Yeah, I think, one, it's still, I don't know when it'll actually hit me that we're actually going. I think Taryn and I talk about it. It may just be whenever we're playing our first game. Um, but yeah, it's still just crazy to think about. But as far as just how dominant the Americans have been in the past, especially on the women's side in beach volleyball, I think it's just a lot of pride just getting the opportunity to wear and represent those three letters across our chest. That's just something we're super proud of and could not be just more prideful of it. And that's just something we hope whenever we go and compete, we can show the rest of the world and especially the United States, everyone who's watching that we are putting just everything we have into it to go represent and put on for what I think is the best country. And you're in the, one of the greatest cities in the world. Some might say the greatest. I mean, uh, and so it's not like going to Sarajevo or something. You're, if you go in Paris, everybody recognizes that. I mean, everybody watches the Olympics, but there's something special about being right in the middle of that part. Um, oh, yeah. Have you thought about any of that? Like your place yep. in history and a place like that? We've actually, we've played in Paris. This will be our third time going to Paris, but the Olympic setup, we get to play in the Eiffel Tower Stadium, oh, which my goodness. I'm not sure if you've seen the venue, what the venue looks like for beach volleyball. I may be a little biased, but I definitely think we have the best venue. Well, of tell the me, Olympics. I've been to the Eiffel Tower, so tell me so where it is. So beach volleyball is right underneath the Eiffel Tower. They're building courts literally right underneath. So the backdrop of there's going to be us playing beach volleyball in the background, the that, giant it, Eiffel Tower, it, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. How can it gorgeous. get any better than that? Seriously. Yeah, unless, it, you got, unless you're playing on the water and you got the Statue of Liberty. I yeah. mean, that's that's one of the, uh, obviously, the iconic uh, monuments that we have in this world. Oh, so and you, it's it really is. There's so many. I've... I feel like you hear so many things about it and it's just you can set your high your expectations really high but when we actually saw it in person it it took our breath away it really it was way bigger than I thought it was going to be oh, so wow. Wow. that was actually one of the the first times where it wasn't like a little underwhelming it was more like whoa this is a really cool uh, place every time anybody goes next to it you just realize oh my goodness because you always see a little from a distance and you get up there and you and I've climbed the steps. I guess you can yep. take an elevator, and that's yeah, no easy Yeah, I took feat. the elevator. I don't think I, I can do it climb now. the steps, but. <laughs> when did you get into this, like the beach part of it? Like, how, how old were you? I started sophomore year of high school, but really didn't get into it until junior year. Um, it was actually, funny enough, it was a, there's a slam and jam tournament that all the local high schools do at Coconut Beach. It's like a six-man tournament. Okay. And my friend had asked me. She had called me up. She was like, hey, do you want to play? I was like, yeah, sure. We went out. Absolutely loved it. This was a six-man tournament, but then on, on, on sand. On, on sand, yes. Right, okay. But then the following day there was a doubles tournament, and that same friend asked me if I wanted to play in the doubles tournament. And I was like, uh, Yeah, sure. Why not? I had so much fun playing the sand. Let's go do it. We got absolutely destroyed. Right. Like, we didn't. I don't even know if we got double digits because <laughs> we were just so young. We had no idea what we were doing. But absolutely loved it, and since then, it's just the rest is history kind of thing. Okay, so when you're growing up, you know, I, I, I know you weren't used to two-on-two -two at that point, right? But mm -hmm. when you grow up, you play pickup. You can't always get 12 people. Like in basketball, if I got three or four, if I got four, like we got a game. So were you used to it all kind of running around the court as far as just staying in your place when you have six? Um, I never really played beach, so what just – in and itself, playing on the surface of sand is different. Harder move. Um, so, and in indoor volleyball, you never really go out and just play uh, four. You typically kind of have to play six, or you don't really do pickup games, especially in high school. So as far as just the different number of people on the court, I, it was very different. But I really enjoyed it because you just have – so much more impact on the game. You touch the ball every single every time. Every single play. Whereas that's not the case sometimes if you have six people on the court. Explain that though exactly because I want you to tell people so when they watch the Olympics or follow you, when does the AVP season start? The AVP season starts in uh, middle of May. So it's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, but talk about the, the different moves. Obviously, we know words like dig and strike, but tell people what that's about. Yeah, so in beach volleyball, you really have to do all of the skills. You have to be able to pass, so in serve, receive, there's only two people. One of the, one of the people is getting served, so you have to be able to pass, and then you have to be able to set the ball, or you can bump set or hand set. Um, you'll find a lot of times in the Olympics, there's a lot of people will be hand setting now. Bump setting is kind of uh, more of an old school uh, route, so you'll see a lot of hand setting, and then just some sort of attack, a spike, a shot, whatever you want to call it. Those are kind of the um, offensive terminologies, sure, and sure. then you you got the a dig, and then. 
Um, dig's a defensive good. move, right? Dig is a defensive move. So, yeah, hopefully I will be getting a lot of digs in Paris. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it blows me away when you see somebody that's 6'4", 6'5", just spiking. All of a sudden you see the girl just diving and pulling it out of the sand. And you got the defensive MVP in the entire, let's just call it the world, right? It is the AVP. It's not just the United States League. They got teams from all over the place. What makes you the best defensive player in that league? What, what, I think what skills I, do you have? I think I have to give a lot of credit to Taryn. She is, like you said, she's 6'4", so she does a great job of making her presence felt at the net, and that makes teams have to maybe shoot the ball a little higher than they're typically used to, and it gives me more time to just kind of run around behind her and uh, get the ball up. And honestly, I think my 5'6 my stature may help me on that closer side of things. Closer to the ground, right. I'm, I'm I didn't think about that. Yeah. Ground. Yeah, so just basically, and also just a lower uh, center of gravity, so everything just easier to move, faster reaction times. So, yeah, being 5'6 may have it, its, its small uh, – benefit or pro as opposed to what people may think not so much. You're traveling around the world pretty much now, obviously, uh, certainly all over the country when you play. But being from New Orleans, we're proud. We're proud being from here. I, I know this. I, I left for 30 years and being in D.C. was like the first place after college. And I'm, I just remember loving New Orleans and talking about New Orleans. And I know you love your own city, too. We love people that love us. But the fact is, is that What's it like when you go other places and you tell people you're from New Orleans? Oh, I, I am definitely a proud Louisiana, and, and we've actually been fortunate enough that we have had the support of our state, the Office of Tourism for Louisiana. Billy helped us, or Yeah, or Billy Nungesser, right. they helped support us our first year, and then New Orleans and company came in and helped us this past year. And uh, being able to wear – they were our top sponsor. They were on our hats. Everyone got to see it if they were – at the event or if they were tuning in on the live stream they saw new orleans and company or louisiana on our hats and that's just something again i love it you represent yeah absolutely and that's something that does mean so much to me because i think anyone from louisiana you are it is just a sense of pride that you just have for your state and anytime whether you're competing in the state or, or across the world you just want to go perform for for your state and when you're out of the state or out of the country and you hear an accent, I'm just speaking for myself, you're like, you're from New Orleans, right? And it's an instant bond. And I'm not saying other cities don't have it. I'm not saying we're better than any other place, but we have more fun, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think New Orleans especially has its own unique vibe to it. And I don't think there's, there's no way to really describe it other than I tell people you just have to come. You yeah. have to come experience it and be here. What's your favorite food? Oh, that's just so hard. I, I'm a big foodie and... I don't know. I do. I haven't had crawfish yet this this, this year. Season. Yeah, this but year. But do you love crawfish? Oh, I love okay. crawfish. Yeah. And I haven't had it yet this year, so maybe that's why I'm just. A, I'm like, mm, maybe I'll go crawfish. So my three kids in Atlanta, uh, one of them doesn't eat seafood, but the other two, when they're like four and five, I'd bring them home during the sun or you know late spring, summer, and people would just watch them eat it. They <laughs> just like they've been doing it for 40 years. Boom. <laughs> And oh, that's yeah. if you love crawfish. I, I can't get enough because if you don't do it fast, you're not going to get as much as you should. Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about. You, now, are we co considering Taryn um, Cloth, your partner, 6'4", is she a native New Orleans now that she's from South Dakota, which to me is also unusual for the sport. Yeah. But we, we say she has been adopted to the state of Louisiana. Obviously, she's still um, very much loyal to her South Dakota. Sure. Uh, people but she definitely has been adopted by the state and she she's a part of the family um so yeah we've taken we, we've taken her we claim her now <laughs> do we call them south dakotans or south dakotians like we do in louisiana oh, i think south dakotans south dakotans okay yeah um as far as lsu I, and i know that i saw i saw something that you were narrating the other day is lsu had beach volleyball for 10 years yeah i saying? think this is the 11th year now okay I so think they're that in the 11th year last year and you mm -hmm. played for four there or five four i had five but including a you COVID had the COVID year. year right yeah. mm -hmm. so where has it gone from the beginning which is a little bit before you got there right to where it is now on the college scene oh my goodness lsu and they, where did we rank yeah right i think right now where you may be like 10 or so um but has the best com the best facility complex in the country, hands down. No other collegiate beach volleyball program has what the LSU Where is it has. exactly? Because I just went to a tennis match up there, and they didn't have where it is now when I went. So yeah. where is y'all's It's actually at the old tennis courts. Oh, they over there on the other sand. side. Okay. Yes, right by the um, That's where LSU gym, gymnastics practice facility. I know is. well, yeah. It's right over there. And 
they, I mean, LSU does their athletics top notch, and they did not um, disappoint with beach volleyball. Yeah, I'm telling you, it is absolutely gorgeous, just state of the art. The locker rooms are right there. It's, it really is. It's, it's very nice, and we were spoiled. And, but that, like you said, it, it has grown. When I played my first two years, we were playing at a complex, actually, funny enough, where I train now called uh, Mangoes. And that's actually where we played our first two seasons there. And okay. then what's we mangoes? Were, what does that mean? It's just an outdoor complex. Oh, it's it just sounded like a daiquiri shop. Oh. Okay, I didn't know mangoes. They do right. have they do have some good ones as well because right. it is it is a bar area, but it's a mangoes outdoor. It is LSU. Complex. We gotta have a bar nearby, <laughs> right? Um, as far as the Tigers when you were there, and I don't want you to be bashful here. No time to be bashful. Y'all were 36 and 0. You had another partner early on. Uh, Taryn was playing for Creighton, right? Uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, mm -hmm. um, y'all were 36 and 0, and you were like the four-time MVP of something. I don't know. I, I don't think it's just the team. I think you're the league or whatever league you're in. Let's just say you're very good, and you, you were great with your other partner as well. But what made you and Taryn so special? When did you realize it? I think that was Taryn and I. It was started. We were just kind of friends off the court, mm -hmm. and whenever it actually was in part due to COVID, because we. Ended our season, she went home, I went home, I came back to New Orleans, and she was like sick of being in the cold, and she just called me up, and she was like, hey, can I come back down to Louisiana and train? Because, again, she was sick of the cold, wanted to come back down, and we just started training. We had we didn't even know if we were going to have a season. I love uh, these shots of y'all. I mean, Those these are, are some great. fun ones. These are great. I mean, so when did you when did you feel, feel like y'all were going to be not just good but great? I think it was during that that COVID stretch when it was we one we didn't even know if we were going to have a season to sure. come back to. We we had no idea, and we just went to our uh, then volunteer coach. He is now our still our current coach, Drew Hamilton, and we were just like we we want to get insane. And we will listen to everything you say, whether nutrition, in the gym, on the court. He's like an all-encompassing coach. But we were just like, whatever you tell us, we will do. So it was actually the su that summerish before we went into that COVID year and uh -huh. had the 36-0 and 0 season. That right. is when we really put in the work. And that's when we were like, whoa, we, could, we may be able to do something with this after college. You didn't know this until yesterday when I told you, but I had met you over the phone because I because my show couldn't be on the air because we talked to people like this, COVID wouldn't allow it. So I went to WWL and I was with producing Bobby A. Bear and the Tillier. I'd chime in some, but I was blown away then because you had just won your first tournament. They got in there. Let me tell you something real quick. You know how hard it is to win. There's so many great teams out there, and they went in their first tournament in New Orleans of all places at Coconut Beach, I'm assuming, yep. and they won their first tournament. That's not the biggest, of course, but you won your first one, and then they're going around winning in Atlanta, winning all over the country, and then around the world. I mean, these girls got good quick, and I'm going to tell you something about girl volleyball players. They don't like the new kids on the block, okay? They've been around. Some of these girls have been playing in the, this league for 20-plus years, at least because I knew some of them that are still playing when I went in 17 years ago, and they were veterans then, like April Ross. But the fact is, is you got to picture this. All the girls train by beaches, right? Florida, California mostly. Some go up to Colorado and do some stuff, but you don't get anybody from South Dakota for sure, and very few, if any, from Louisiana. So when you come in and start winning, they don't probably take kindly to that. And I'm not telling you to, to talk about the inner circles of the cattiness there, but the fact is, is you can get look sideways sometimes, don't you? I think we definitely surprised some teams. I think some people were just like, who, one, who are these college girls? And right. let alone, who are these Louisiana girls? That's what we kind of got dubbed. We were the, the Louisiana or the LSU girls at I'll the beginning. That. Yeah. Was... And it, it, again, there definitely, it's not, um, there weren't people super like catty or anything, but it was, it was just like, who, who are these new girls who are just like, they are, they're coming in and winning. It's like, what is happening and they're not training in California or Florida and that's something when Taryn and I started out on this journey I always said from the beginning I wanted to rewrite the script of what beach volleyball is and you don't have to move to California to train you can stay where you are from and to me that means a lot to me and the fact that we were able to now have kind of rewritten the script is kind of surreal and cool that that is one of the goals we kind of set out for and it has kind of been accomplished 
Um, but yeah, so I guess just it all comes back to still being able to represent Louisiana is mm -hmm. something uh, very near and dear to my heart. You know, you didn't believe me when I said this yesterday. I talked to you on the phone for the first time, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, right? And I said I was looking forward to this interview as much as any, and I meant that because, I mean, listen, I've had the second leading score in NBA history at the time, Carl Malone on, and I love basketball. Everybody knows that's my favorite sport, but I love beach volleyball now, and I'm going to tell you, when I, the Olympics come on, it's the first thing I want to watch, and it's not just because the girls look good. I love to watch the yeah. men. It's, it's phenomenal to see this athleticism and to see the way y'all go at it because I'll still love track and field and, of course, yeah. hoops and all the other stuff, swimming. But it's become an event that's almost must watch. And I, I think, think it's like one of like the the third most watched sport in the Summer Olympics. Yeah. Which I mean, if we can keep that trend and maybe even push it to it's one or two. It's gonna get better. Trust me. I mean, it's yeah. only been around for uh, three decades at most in the Olympics, and others have been around for over a century. So I'm sure it will. I, I, I've had a great time with you. I wish we could do an hour. I mean, but we have other guests, so I gotta do this. We're gonna sign two things for you. Because we're going to do gold. Uh, the Jay Johnson, right after one, yes. the, the national championship it. brought that for me. And we're putting gold on purple. And then you're going to be on Brian Kelly's ball right here. Oh. We got this ball for him last year. He's coming in a couple weeks, I by the way. On this side? Anywhere you want. Where? Anywhere you want. Put it in the front. Let people know who you are. Uh, but it's been great having you. We also give gifts. And let's see wow. what I have here for you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to give treat, one for your, your partner, too. So I got, I was trying to find two purple. The purple is a new color. It's really lavender, but it's close enough. It's a and fun spring color. So this is Task Performance, and I've been doing this for a decade, handing shirts out, and, um, you know, I tell people this all the time, Drew Brees and, and, and Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis, when I first came back to New Orleans, I'm going to training camp, and they're all wearing this stuff. So I, I just went right to the place where they make them and said, hey, yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of y'all. We've been that for now really 12 years if you got the radio side. Yeah. So I didn't have that color for Taryn, but please give her this one and tell her we're going to have her she after y'all win that gold medal. Yes, you come absolutely. back together. Absolutely. And let me give you a little restaurant gift certificate. You're a foodie, you say. I am a well, foodie. Well, this is one of my favorites. It's called Chez de la Chez. And I have Mr. John's Steakhouse, which I'll probably give to my next guest because he, he likes red meat, I'm assuming. Uh, but the <laughs> fact is, is I, this is a great place. It's on Maple Street awesome. between Carrollton and Broadway. And you can also go to the regular Della Chaise, which is more of a wine bar than a sit-down restaurant. But, Chris, it's been Appreciate a pleasure. It. Pleasure, yes. Thank you very much. we got a legend here, y'all. Uh, and pretty soon you're going to be noticing it yourself because she's going to be an, uh, an everyday name after the Olympics. So, Kristen Nuss, Taryn, hey, good luck. I'm wishing you all the best. And, hey, like I said, I haven't had a lot of other sports until this past five months. Swimming, golf, even uh, tennis. And I've been bringing them. I had more fun with this, as, as much fun at least, as, as doing the Saints, Pels, and all the rest of stuff. So wish you the best of luck. Represent New Orleans and have some fun more. That's most important. Get the experience. Hey, coming up next, we're going to have some Tulane coming up. Later in the show, we're going to have Connor Rasmussen. He's batting 320 right now for the Wave, doing great things. He's transferred from East Carolina. He's second baseman, starting. He hits in the three hole. But next, we got a guy that was at Tulane a few years ago, came back. Got some more training somewhere else in Stony Brook up in New York, and now he's back as the Associate Athletic Director. We're going to talk about a lot of things right there with Justin Berger next on Primetime Sports. You've been to games, you've seen the hard hits, felt the ground shake. You've heard the fans erupt, and you've watched the team answer. You've seen sports in the city, but until you see Nola Gold, you ain't seen a thing. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. What a treat that was, at least for me, and I hope it was for you to have Kristen Duss on representing us in the Olympics coming up, and they have a great shot to win it. But we're going to go to the business side of sports. Last year, about this time, actually, 
I had both LSU's NIL le leader and Tulane's, Mike Arata, Tulane, Gordon McCurran, LSU. And we learned a lot about how it works in the NIL. They do things differently. NIL is, of course, na name, image, and likeness on how they pay the players today. That became legal in 21, and it's been growing, growing, growing. And at Tulane, it grew exponentially, particularly after they beat USC in the Cotton Bowl. Uh, and then it really grew, and now they're something special. But they have other things. They still have old-fashioned fundraising like they did in the old days back in 2020 around COVID time. And right now we have a guy that's a young guy that I would be surprised if he's not an athletic director one day. I fully believe he will be. His name is Justin Berger. He's from the Northeast in the New York, New Jersey area. He went to college at Stony Brook, then Albany, played some lacrosse up there, and then he started looking to his future. And he came to Tulane a few years ago was in the administration and then he left for a year to go to Stony Brook getting some more seasoning as we like to say here in Louisiana and came back and now he's a senior associate athletic director of development etc at the age of 30 and, and looking for great things his name is Justin Berger welcome to the show my friend thanks Scott it's good to be here good to see you man so what made you decide to go from being on a college player to darn good one because I did my research yeah. to want to get in the business side of athletics yeah it's a great question uh, I'd answer it in two ways. So, one, my upbringing. Uh, I mentioned to you yesterday when we spoke on the phone, um, my dad worked for the New York Giants yeah. for my entire life. And I got a bunch of stuff backing that up. Uh, I sent yeah. my producer last night a bunch of Giants stuff with your dad in it. Yeah. And keep going. I'm yeah, no, so um, so I, that was why I was exposed to, right? That's really all I've ever known is uh, being around athletes, being around sports, uh, supporting. Wow, how about that? That's a great find. That's a, that's a great Oh, yeah, I had some serious hair. I love it. That was freshman year. Right, we're, we're crossing here. I was a lacrosse player. I thought the hair was cool. No, it is cool. So that was before I transferred and, and short. cut you my hair. You that one back. I appreciate that. I got some other shots. Oh, in this that's, is great. That's, you guys did your research. That's little Justin Burger right Holy there. Holy smokes. That's awesome. We got awesome. some stuff like you went to Giants games. You you got to see two Super Bowl champions <laughs> with, with a Louisiana New Orleans quarterback yeah, right there, Eli Manning. I, I sure did. He's the best. And I, you beat Tom Brady twice. But go ahead, what you were saying about your No, so, that, so that's one part, right? But your dad was part of the organization for 40 years. Yeah, a long, long time, and the Giants organization is incredible and uh, really welcomed me in. So I, I was a ball boy for a long time uh, and grew up around sports, right? I was at training camp, was at all of the games, uh, and really learned about uh, all of the effort, everything that goes into supporting the athletes, supporting the coaches. Did you uh, have any idea how well that pay off later? And the reason I ask is one thing. Yeah. Tim Floyd, not many people know this, was a ball boy with the Saints. Yeah. High school and college, yeah. right? Yeah. And then he became one of the best coaches in our region. He's from Hattiesburg, yeah. but you know, he coached UNO. And yeah. but he, but my point is, he said the same thing. He learned yeah. from doing it, giving him more responsibility, yeah. and he got to see the business side. Was it the same with you? You know, it wasn't something at the time that I ever thought would be a career, or, or that I even sort of processed what I was learning. But certainly now, I mean, I, even today, I fall back on some of those values. Right, you're 13, 14, 15 years old, and, and learning how to work hard. Right, yeah. learning how to to run around and. Um, and always be helping the organization, always be helping the team, always be helping the athletes. Stay out of the way, but, but support everybody else. And those are still principles that are important to me today. So, so that's one part of right. how I sort of ended up doing this. The other is, is as you mentioned, was my own student athlete experience. Sure. Um, I was a, a Division One lacrosse player at Stony Brook for a year, and then I transferred to Albany. Let and me there say for four years. For Stony yeah, Brook. go ahead. We know Stony Brook here, guys. <laughs> Y'all remember this when LSU was predicted to be one of the contenders yeah. for the national championship? Yeah. Both Stony Brook had a surprise winning of their regional to come down to Baton Rouge. I remember because I, I was in Atlanta and brought my kids. And then Stony Brook beat LSU two out of three, which is what the super regional is, yeah. two out of three. And then you go to the World Series. So we are well aware of Stony Brook. Yeah. And I know a lot because I have friends that went there. But yeah. continue with your story. But no, so hey. it's funny you mentioned that. So my freshman year that I spent at Stony Brook was 2012, was oh. the year that Stony Brook went to the College World Series. There, then. Yeah, it was incredible. And I was friends with a lot of the baseball players and went to Omaha oh, wow. uh, to okay. support them and be there. And it was awesome. And, and it's funny, right? Did I know then that Stony Brook would come back to my life? No. Right, right, right forward a decade later and I just spent two years as the associate AD for development at Stony Brook uh, and thought a lot about you know my student my own student athlete experience when I was working there but so yeah so I was a student athlete at Albany and uh, and had a fantastic experience got really involved um, in uh, what is called student athlete advisory committee yeah um, SAC oh. it's basically a student know, council well. for yeah. athletes yeah, yeah that's right Sean James is part it, of that yeah he's, he's been on the show twice he's incredible he's I mean, amazing what, a, what a, a superstar with a bright future um, Tulane but, basketball player by the way just yeah, and, he's, and he's, he is, he's as good as it gets. These are your shots? And yeah, all and, I, and I, it was a fantastic experience, right? And so, again, without knowing what I was preparing for, um, I, I got to be part of uh, America East SAC, and I got to be on NCAA Division 
in one sack and attend these national meetings, uh, hear from leaders, learn about sort of how the sausage is made in college athletics. Very cool. Um, and so I didn't know I was preparing, preparing for a career in college athletics, but that's what I was doing. No doubt. And so um, I finished undergrad. I actually, not to get too deep into it, but thought I was going to go to medical school. Sure. Come to that decision right then. Hey, I don't think that's the future for me. I don't think I really want to be a I doctor. I see you as a doctor, though. It's not, yeah, well, maybe, but in a different life. You can have more fun but with this. Trust <laughs> that's, me. That's, but that's not my passion. And, and so it was that sort of aha moment of what do I really love and, and what am I meant to be doing? And it, it really wasn't hard. It was, uh, you know, over the course of an hour, I said, this, this is what I'm meant to be doing. I'm meant to work in college athletics. And like you mentioned, hopefully one day be an athletic director. I'm so. assuming Troy Dannon hired you the yeah, first time. So I right. asked Troy like I've done every athletic director. I've had certainly everyone in, in the southern part of this state, Tulane and LSU, yeah. you know, whoever it's been. But I always ask him this because I want – and you're kind of telling us as, as we do this. Yeah. Like, how, how does it, if someone's out there sitting out there wanting to be an athletic director one day, what's a blueprint? I know there's not wow. one. It's like when I became an agent. There's not one blueprint yeah. to do it, circumstances. But, you know, you will be an athletic director. Let's make no bones about it. I'm not sure where it's going to be. I appreciate but that. But you will yeah. be. But the fact is, is uh, if you were talking to somebody at your early stage of your career, yeah. what would you tell them? What's well, a great question. You know, and it's funny, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to some of the fundraising talk. 100%. But, but the, the, the best answer I can give, there's probably 100 different answers you can give to that, but it's just be great at what you do, right? Is, is add value, be great at what you do, and if you do a great job with what your responsibilities are today, doors will open for you. And that's, that's a great answer. Right, we've talked about, you know, and I do, I appreciate it. I have an awesome job, and I'm 30 years old, and so far things have gone okay in my career. And I, I haven't, I mean, you know, at the same time, right, I, I, think about this idea of like begin with the end in mind sure. so so I do know where I aspire to go but that's not something I'm thinking about every day right, right I'm not right. I'm not well, you're doing thinking your job about, as that's, best you that's can do right. It, right yeah you do this really really well and then more opportunities will present themselves but those opportunities don't present themselves to you if you don't do a really great job with what you're doing right now so how, it's, it, you have a talent that I obviously that I, I cannot dream of having yeah. and that's asking people for money yeah, you, yeah. in your business you can do yeah, yeah. Um, going from Atlanta working Fox and TNT and all that you didn't have to get your own sponsor yeah uh, you do here yeah and and it's just different and I'm yeah. not good at asking for money I love yeah. putting TV together but yeah. how do you get that skill like what makes you good at your job because that's part of it yeah. you do a lot of things but develop Bringing money into the to the to the school is a big deal. It is, it, and it's a lot of fun. And, and so, when you actually talk about fundraising, we talk yeah. about it as an art and a science. Yeah. But to get over that first initial, a lot of people have this initial hesitation or misunderstanding, I think, of of, of what we do as fundraisers. Um, and so, what I've said, and I, I've said this to other people, I have never closed a gift from somebody who wasn't equally as excited about making that gift as I was about helping them make the That's gift. Very right? cool That's, to say. Wow. Th and so, and that. Y as you sort of progress and develop in your career and, and do more of the, the major gift fundraising work, you're working with people who are passionate about Tulane or passionate about Tulane athletics or whatever it might be. And all you're doing is helping them understand how they can make an impact, yeah. right? These, this is the things that you love. This is, this is the part of your experience that meant the most. This is an opportunity that we have, a need that we have right now. I connect those two things. And now we all feel great about this. I sure. help Tulane advance. You make an impact. I help you understand the impact you're making. And so I think if you have that understanding that people have this idea of like, oh, I, I couldn't uh, reach into people's pockets. That's not what it is. Right. That's, that's, that is not well, what I do at, at all. Right. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. I have never closed a gift from somebody who wasn't equally as excited about making the gift as I was of helping them make it. Right. That, that part. And so once you understand that, um, then, yeah, you just experience helps and then, you know, art and science. Right. And, and we don't need to get into what those are. There's certainly a relationship aspect. And then there's some data that that helps us make decisions like any other career. But I think you got to get over that initial hesitation. And then it's a lot of fun. Anybody that's graduated from an organization, a school, a college, whatever, has been, for lack of a better term, hit up by the school. Yeah, right. And, yeah. You know, when I'm doing well, of course, I'll donate when yeah. I'm not. I can't. So yeah. point being is, is that that y'all it's like it's the lifeblood of any school absolutely it's getting the donations from yeah. people and whether you be a grad or to somebody that admires the school or you maybe you grew up cheering for them yeah. and i know tulane is very good at doing this yeah. and they have a very good alumni base yeah. and they really do incredible so you do this all year round but y'all have something coming up this week and I, i'm interested because we talked about it briefly and you said something that struck me because a lot of us whether those times you're not doing as well, yeah. and you're not, you know, you maybe you gave a bigger number before, but yeah. you don't, you know, you feel intimidated, like, hey, I feel small now, I can't do it, right. so you just ignore the call. Yeah. But what do y'all do? Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. Great segue. So 
Um, this Wednesday, April 10th, and Thursday, April 11th is Tulane University. Which is tomorrow and next day. Yes, Wednesday and Thursday of this week sure. is uh, Give Green is what it's called. It's Tulane's Day of Giving, uh, and it is an organized campaign to try to get exactly what you just said, as many people to make gifts back to Tulane University as possible. Wow. What matters most on Give Green is not the size of the gift, right? We don't care if you can give $100,000 or not. That's not what matters on Give Green, okay. on, on our day of giving. What matters is, is you raising your hand and saying, yes, Tulane matters to me. Tulane athletics matters to me. I want to support the institution. I want to support the cause. I'm going to take five minutes of my time. I'm going to go onto the website, givegreen.tulane.edu. And um, no gift is too small. That's precisely right. I'm going to make a gift, right? And, and I'm going to make a gift of $10 or $50 or certainly we'd love if you choose to give more. If you're able to give more, we, we certainly would encourage that. But that's not what tomorrow is about. Right. right? Tomorrow is about participation and, and you have an opportunity to say, hey, this place matters to me. I want to make a difference. And, and I think one of the things that I mentioned to you is what we celebrate isn't any one individual gift. It is the collective impact of what happens when all of these people, hundreds, thousands of people around the world come together and make a gift of whatever size. That adds up. We will Tomorrow we'll raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for our department, millions of dollars for the university. Right. Together, that makes an incredible impact. I love the way you said that, Justin, because it's not like the we all want the amount of dollars. Of course, right. if you're rich, but you want everybody to feel involved. That's right. And if you could give 50 or 100, it adds I up. I mean, it's all, but it's all everybody feeling they're part of it. You that's, know what I mean? That's that's precisely right. You that's know? that's exactly right. And so, uh, as well on Give Green, there's there's a couple different challenges and matches and things going on uh, to incentivize participation. All of those are based on donor count, right? So uh, let me explain. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We have in the athletic department a challenge going on tomorrow. When we hit 402 donors, yeah. then we will unlock a $10,000 challenge gift. It's not about how much money we raise, it's about yeah. how many people make a gift. How do people do it? Yeah, so uh, the easiest way is to go onto the website, like right. I mentioned. Givegreen.tulane.edu. That's the easiest way um, for most people. And it starts tomorrow, like if you're watching this Tuesday when it's live. Yep. So it, it starts Wednesday evening at 6.34 p.m. Oh. Yeah, that's 1834 military time, the year Tulane was founded. No, that's big. I like yeah, that. That's, that's really creative. 1834, <laughs> if you're in the military, you know what I'm talking about, 634. That's right. So it starts Wednesday, April 10th, 634. It's all day Thursday. And all day Thursday. Well, that's hey, right. if you have any love for Tulane, particularly if you went there, but hey, a lot of us didn't go there. We just grew up liking them. Or even if you just admire them as... Hey, they all need help. So help them out tomorrow. Mean Green, or no, Give Green. Give Green. Mean Green is the North Texas team. That's right. Yeah, no, no, that's, uh, they have their own giving day. Tomorrow is, is all about Tulane. It's right. all about the Green Wave, and, and we hope you'll support. One and more I time at the website. Yeah, Give Green. Dot Tulane dot edu. Let me also give our phone number. Yeah, uh, that might ahead, be the most ahead, helpful. The Green Wave Club phone number, 504 865 5356. If you call it, Say that'll, one more time. You know we do. 504 865 5356. You call it, you'll get a member of our staff, and we'd be happy to help. Justin, I look forward to seeing your future, and I remember the little guys when you get to the top, all right? <laughs> I appreciate hey, that. Hey, by the way, uh, this is a new color that Task came out. I know it's not exactly your green, but it's green enough. It's sharp. And, and I'll also say Task, Al Andrews, yeah. uh, the founder of Task, well, a, a Tulane basketball letter winner. He's the last SEC, all-SEC player. Yeah, it's incredible. In Re rest in peace. He was also an amazing man. So this he, is a cool gift. certainly meaningful. was. And he's one of my favorite guys, and I, I, I talk about Al a lot on this show, yeah. too. And I had him on. To talk about his career, he averaged 19 point something. All he was incredible. Yeah, and he and you look at him, it's like nobody believes I played, but you know, I'm like, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, Al more so because this guy was a true legend. Yeah, you know? and he, and and what we do, he stayed involved. He yeah. gave back to the program. He, he gave did. back to Tulane. He was around. We miss him very and much. And his son Todd is running it well. So hey, They're great. We also have Desi Vega. You know Desi Vega Steakhouse. Well, this is his other restaurant that uptown, closer to Tulane, called. Mr. John Steakhouse. Awesome. Thank you. So I know a lot of Tulane events are over there, uh, thanks to Michael Ratt and guys like that, yeah. because I've, I've stepped in on them. When Willie won his 280th game yeah, or whatever, they, they there, had right? something. I was yeah. over there, too. So, yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, hey, support the Wave and support all the local teams. I've had a lot of UNO presence on this show lately, a lot of LSU, of course. But to support your colleges. Go out, and if nothing else, I'm going to the Tulane UNO game tonight because this game, this show, as you know, is taped the same day. But let's be real. It's light outside. It's not It's not right now. So by, in four hours, five hours, that's I'll right. be at the Tulane I'll UNO I'll see you game. there. I'll be there. I'll be there. Good. Hey, coming up next, speaking of that, I have a guy that's playing in that game. That's right. He's got a game. He's the three-hole hitter. He plays second base. His name's Connor Rasmussen, and he's doing unbelievable things. He's a South Carolina native who played at East Carolina last year when LSU shocked the world and beat them in that AAC championship game. And he decided to come join the good guys down here in New Orleans. 
better food. Not saying anything. I love East Carolina's campus, but it's a little nicer down here. He's next right here on Primetime Sports. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. Man, until I had Justin, it's been a month since I did two-lane stuff. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but I've been having – they've been so good about giving me access because they're right around the corner basically from here. UNO, I've put a focus on them the last couple of weeks. Of course, Pelicans and Saints. We're always going to talk about them and the LSU Tigers, of course. But I love having the Green Wave over here as well, just like I love having the privateer stuff. But like I said, until Justin, it's been a month. But we're not going to make you wait another month or even another show. We're going right back at it because we have the second baseman who bats in the three-hole. And when I think about that, that three-hole position when you're batting is one of your power guys. And, and the only guy I can think of, it's two of them that come to mind. If you're old like me, you remember Joe Morgan at the, the, the greatest team of all time, in my opinion, the mid-70s Big Red Machine that won two straight World Series. He was a three-hole hitter. And then Jeff Kent, who played for the San Francisco Giants and other, among others, he was that way. So you don't see a lot of second bases. Carlos Barrego is a big hitter. But... I love a guy that can hit the three hole. He, he's first weekend here. Connor Rasmussen is my guest, and he came from East Carolina. If 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 you don't know, ask somebody. That's a powerhouse in college baseball generally. And but they came in his first weekend. They split the first two games with Northwestern, not the one up in Natchitoches, the real one. No offense, Bobby A. Bear, but the one that's in the Big Ten up there in Evanston, right outside Chicago, Illinois. So this is a Big Ten team, and they're down. In the, in the last inning, my man here hits a, a, a grand slam. In his first weekend, wearing the green. And there he is, Connor Rasmussen. He hasn't slowed down yet, <laughs> batting around 320. Yes, Welcome to the show. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Welcome to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. This place is awesome. So. Tell me real quick, what made you come? I mean, what, what made you... You saw it, by the way, your last game before you got to the NCAA tournament was mm -hmm. losing to a very surprised wave team, right? <laughs> yes, they had it a losing was. record in, in Coach Jay Ullman's first year. He had mm -hmm. a lot of new players, but they got it together and, and won that tournament. So, right. what did you see in them to make you want to be a part of it? You know, um, I think their tournament run that they went on last year really says a lot about the guys that they had on the team last year. Right. And those guys that have stuck around and, and are kind of an older, an older guy presence in the locker room. And it just says a lot for them to go through what they went through in the regular season last year to get it together to play really good baseball the la when it mattered ultimately sure. and ultimately make a regional. I mean, they made the tournament, man. Yeah, and then, you know, it's an automatic bid and, and mm -hmm. they have good teams in the conference. I mean, yes, Carol, your do. team was the favorite mm -hmm. and they got to the finals and, and won that game. I'll never forget. I was so happy for everybody involved in the program. <laughs> I'd had the big pitcher, Carmouche on, mm -hmm. you know, the show plus Jay, of course, and, and the old regime. And I, I was just so happy to see some success. Yeah. And you saw maybe a camaraderie that they had that yeah. you wanted to be a part of? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, it's not easy. Uh, college baseball, winning college baseball games is not an easy thing to do. And uh, for them to go through what they went through, I know they had, they had a really tough conference record going into that week, mm -hmm. but ultimately played well when it mattered and ultimately got to a regional, which is every college And they played LSU school. better than anybody else exactly. until the World yeah. Series. They had, I mean, they had a chance to win that ball it game. It was tied late. It was. It was. And, and for me, kind of seeing that, like on the outside looking in, because last year at ECU, we, we went to a regional. We went to uh, University of Virginia. And I remember kind of keeping track of Tulane because uh, it was, I mean, we just wanted to see how our conference sure. kind of went up, and especially them going against LSU, who was last Ooh. year the number one team in the country for most of the season. Almost all year and the World Series champion. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, I mean, we saw they had Paul Skeens going, and for them to throw Paul Skeens against Tulane, who had, who had 19 wins, kind of says a lot about how they played in that last week. So. I mean, it, it is remarkable, and I, I, I was hoping that they would bring – the same kind of passion, and they did. Mm -hmm. It's just they just were outmatched in that game, but they played them tough. And honestly, no one in the regional nor super regional played them even close. It took mm -hmm. till they got later in the World Series, of course, the games against Wake Forest and yep. Florida. But that said, you're in New Orleans now. Have you gotten any delicac delicacies and food? I mean, delicacies <laughs> from New Orleans. What's your favorite thing have you eaten that you never had before you got here? Um, so I surprisingly, I've actually had crawfish a couple times before I got here. I it better it. not just be surprisingly. That's a, that's what <laughs> I we, love eat for, it. we eat for breakfast around here. Yeah, I love it. Um, my personal favorite though is probably I just like a, a shrimp po' boy. Yes, I, they're awesome. So I love I'm 
I agree. Any where kind do, of where do you get them? I'm going to give them um, a free plug, whoever it is. Uh, I believe it's Katie's. Katie's? Yes. Well, Katie's is a good friend. The guy uh, who owns Katie's, a big UNO guy, but he loves Tulane as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I love my play words of friends with him every night. Scott <laughs> Craig, what a yeah. good guy. So you got something on your shirt. I'd be remiss <laughs> not if I asked about it because I know that's not you. You it were number eight. I did enough research on that. <laughs> that's not 45. Uh, this is 45. It okay, is, so uh, what is it? This is Brock Slayton. He's one of our outfielders. So uh, this is a teammate. Yes, it is. Okay, I love the camaraderie. Talk about why you have it. Um, well, uh, I mean, he's one of, one of my good friends on the team, and and uh did you make it for him or i did he... not no he uh i think he had some company make it for him and okay. he posted on his on his social media and i saw it thought it was a cool shirt and ended up buying it and so i figured i uh, figured i'd rep it what's today. the bottom say it says on threads or something uh i think it's the company that uh oh it's the threads okay yeah, correct so brock slate you got your plug man <laughs> this is your night you better hit a big big hit to win the game or something <laughs> um let's talk about your team let's talk mm -hmm. about your coach what what do you love about jay ullman yeah uh and you can say what you don't like about him either <laughs> i mean hey jay it's an open season all yeah, right. no, um, I mean, I, I love playing for Jay. He, uh, he'll do anything, anything for his players and always has his players back, which is really cool to see. Um, he does. He does, and it's, and it's awesome. And, and the coaching staff in general, just uh, with Coach Bridgman, uh, Coach Brittle, Coach Izzio, okay. I mean, they, they make it really easy to play for him, and uh, they always, they're always going to have their players' best interest in mind, which I love. Well, we have a thing that you won the game, and I have a box score with your picture uh, in it with your number. And when y'all won that game, 12-9, I believe it was, mm -hmm. against yeah. Northwestern in the first series of the season. And it, tell me about the thrill. I mentioned it earlier. This, now, this is back when you back were in high, high school. school. That's yeah. high school right there. Yeah, that's awesome. But we have a shot of you with the score on it. Um, it's a graphic. But mm -hmm. the fact is, is when you, you, you won the first game of the series, I believe. No, we lost. You lost, lost but you won the night. Saturday game. Yes, right? correct. And then you had the rubber match, and they were winning. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you take it from there on how you won the game. <laughs> so, I mean, we had, there it is. I believe it was the eighth inning. Um, we had, I mean, it was a big inning for what us. What was the we score uh, before the inning? I don't believe. I know we were down. I think it was like it was, nine, two, or three, or yeah, four. Yeah, I know we were down. Right. Um, but we... Uh, a lot of guys in front of me were able to get on base. Uh, there was a lot of walks beforehand. Right. And uh, I just remember before going into that bat, they took a uh, took a pitchers meeting, and uh, I I figured I was like, all right, he's he's struggling to find the strike zone right now. Um, it's a good chance for a fastball and first pitch. He threw it kind of right where I liked it, and I was able to hit it in the air to right field. So. I love what you said. Okay, say this again because mm -hmm. because you're looking for all the little things, right? Yeah. Because they did the pitcher mound meeting, which mm -hmm. we've all seen, the catcher usually sometimes goes up there, sometimes just the pitcher and the coach. Yeah. And he was struggling to find, you know, the, the strike zone. Yeah, I believe it was, I think it was three straight walks before I got to the plate. Okay, so this was before the at-bat, not in the middle of it? Uh, the, so it was after, I believe it was uh, Colin Tufts walked. So it was had, after his at-bat when I was going to the plate, their coach went so out So this there. time, are you down one? Um, Cause it's, I believe so. Yeah, nine eight, right? Because yes. you won twelve nine. Yeah, you hit a grand slam to <laughs> win a game in your first weekend in New Orleans. Yeah, does it can't get any better than that? It's not just a home run; it's a grand slam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't doesn't really get much better than that. Um, kind of for me, I didn't really play a whole lot last year, so that was really my first taste of being an everyday player in, in college baseball. And so, I mean, it was awesome for us to get that series win, get the get the season going on the right foot. So what's your favorite part about not uh, we talked about the city in a bit again, mm -hmm. but about being on this team on this team? Um, honestly, I just think it's like the relationships with the guys that we have. Um, we have a very tight locker room. Um, you know, everybody, everybody is friends with everybody. Um, everybody hangs out with each other. And so it's not like that most places. And I think that's really cool to see. Well, that's a good segue to what I'm going to say, because mm -hmm. I, like I said, um, I do a little more research than some. Yeah. And this, I heard that you were the king of karaoke. <laughs> and, uh, and so I want you to explain that. I think you opened up people's eyes because you're new to the team relatively, yeah. right? And then you kind of ran the karaoke on a bus ride back <laughs> at night one time. I did, yeah. So I'm going to take it over and let you talk about so, it. So um, I, I took this from, we did this at ECU last year. Uh -huh. um, we had... It was for all the freshmen and all the newcomers there. Right. Um, so oh, what, I love this, by the yeah, way. This is what great. it is is, I mean, you, 
you get up in front of the bus, in front of everybody. Um, You're on the bus driving on the, back. Right. So we, we were going to UL for right. this. Okay, and, you, uh, yeah. Lafayette. Yeah, and so I had I had sent a message out to all the freshmen saying, hey, <laughs> like, when we get on the highway, get ready. Um, and so I kind of got up there. kind of. Can I say if I was a freshman, what I'd say <laughs> to you? I said, you're as new as I am to this team. You're yeah. getting up there, right? No. Yeah. So, no, but, yeah, because you're a transfer there, freshman, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, we're all, all new guys. We have right. a bunch but of new guys. Right, but I love that you team. did this. Sorry. Yeah, but, I mean, I think it, it kind of introduces the freshmen because, I mean, they're new. They're new to college, and so it kind of opens theirs, open theirs eye, opens up their eyes uh, to – so that you okay. So who picks the music? Do they get to pick their so own yeah, song? Yeah, they get they get to pick their own song. Okay, okay. They uh they get up in front of everybody. They have like the microphone the that's on the bus. The bus is moving too, right? Yes, it's on the, the way, right? Okay. Correct. And so uh, we give them headphones, so they can't. All they hear is the song. They cannot hear what they sound like. Oh they my God! So it's they like can't that. hear what people are saying. <laughs> and so, rough. yeah. So all we hear on the bus is them singing, and it's <laughs> it's a really it's really fun because some I gotta guys, try that sometimes. That's yeah, great. some guys really buy into it and do a really good really good job and have a really good performance but the other guys that kind of don't don't try as hard right uh, it shows it shows big time so. well having the thing where you can't hear it because we can always pretend like we know the words because yeah. you can mumble something with the music on yeah that's a twist i've never <laughs> heard before and i love it uh who's the best um so i believe our winner was a freshman pitcher jack boussard okay he uh what was his song do you remember anything he about sang it? uh careless whisperer Yes. Okay, he's a lover. Okay, he okay, is. he and picked put, it himself. He did. And George he Michael on, in the house. Yeah, put on a really good performance. So it was it was really cool to see. I wish I had video of that. <laughs> no, that that sounds like a great idea. What great for camaraderie because like, everybody's having fun with it, right? Yeah. And there you are playing a little infield. I'm assuming. Yeah. Unless you're a, a sideline pitcher like <laughs> get to Kobe back in the Pirates in '79. Yeah. Uh, no, but you got the grand slam. You're also a guy that just sprays the ball. You can hit the yeah, ball. Yeah, correct. So talk about if I was, let's just say for fun, I was an agent. Or no, better yet, a scout. Mm -hmm. And you wanted somebody to talk, maybe the agent talk about you. Yeah. But you're the guy, you're the guy talking about yourself, so don't be yeah. bashful. Okay. Tell us what makes you a good player. Um, I mean, what makes me a good player is I'm, I'm really consistent. I feel like I have uh, a, an approach that I can take to every game and be able to have success in every game. Yeah. Um, so you kind of know what you're going to get on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm going to play really, really good defense at second base or wherever I am in the infield. But uh, ultimately, I'm a team guy. Um, I'll do whatever, whatever the team needs for me to win that game. What's the first time you heard Tulane? Because you're from South Carolina, a small Correct. town. Yeah. Uh, when did Tulane come? Did you know about Tulane at all in high school? Because most people that I've asked mm -hmm. if they're honest, they, they have it. Like yeah. the guys, the football players up from Oregon and, and, you know, yeah, South Florida, right? Yeah, so the really the only time I'd heard about Tulane was on the, uh, like the NCAA football video game. I would always do like the uh, That's the Road to Glory. Yes, right. And uh, I, would always, I would always choose like schools that I've never heard of. And uh, I just remember I chose Tulane one time, ended up winning like three Heisman trophies or something Oh my like goodness, that. Yeah. roll so, wave, Ty yeah. J Spears in the house. <laughs> so now when you saw them play, I mean, let me say this, was it really honestly the first time? Because this was what, what Mario Williams, the receiver, he played at both USC and Oklahoma his freshman year. Yeah. Tulane played Oklahoma during that, that uh, hurricane year. Yeah. Uh, he said that's the first time I even knew what Tulane was. Mm -hmm. And he's not from California. He's, Florida's not that far away. Yeah. And so when you played them in mm -hmm. baseball, you're in the you're same conference, obviously. Yeah. Is that one of the first times? Yes, that was. Um, I kind of got familiar with them in the regular season. We play, played a three-game series in Greenville last year. Right, and right. And then, uh, then playing them again in the, in the conference championship game. That's really how I was introduced to Tulane. So South Carolina, who'd you like growing up? Uh, Gamecocks. Yeah, Gamecocks through and through. So uh, they won a couple. They won a World Series at least. They won, won two of them. Two of them. That's what I thought. Were they, were so they back to back? They were ten and yeah. eleven. So I grew up a, a diehard South Carolina yeah. fan. My whole family went there. My brother actually plays football there now. Um, so still, still a Gamecock. Well, the guy that owns Desi Vega and Mr. Johns is mm -hmm. Desi Vega, and he played baseball at LSU. I mean Tulane. Okay, yeah. And and you got to get to his restaurant. But I'm gonna give you this other one for a reason. Because it, it's walking distance from campus. Yeah, awesome. it's on Maple. I gave I gave it Mr. Johns, and I sometimes I give two or three on the show. But yeah, you know I'll give you one of those another time when you come. But here, this is you can go there. It's on Maple Perfect. Street by Starbucks, in between Carrollton and Broadway. But here's the Perfect. thing, man. Have yeah. you had Task yet? I have not. Feel no. it. Okay, I, I, wow. I, I say this a lot, but once you put that on, you're going to throw away your uh, you're going to throw rocks at. It, in fact, your Under <laughs> Armour. And dry fit because yeah. I put that on first time 12 years ago and I've never stopped wearing it. Yeah, I that's awesome. It. And I love that they're part of the show. Todd Andrews, who, you know, we talked about Al passing away. Todd's running and now doing such a good job. Yes, hey, sir. roll wave. I will be at the game night. Sounds if you're good. watching this live tonight, which is 
we call it live to tape, then we're going to be at the game. Mm -hmm. But we taped this a few hours before, but we'll see you next week, and I cannot wait. We have so many good things coming. Brian Kelly from LSU. Kim Mulkey is going to be coming on, uh, and we have so many others, though. Stay tuned next week right here on Primetime Sports. Sir, thank you so much. Thanks, man. That was fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Selling an unwanted vehicle can be a hassle, but donating it to public media couldn't be easier. All you need is the title, and we'll take care of the rest. For more information or to schedule a pickup, call our toll-free number or visit us online. Hey, I'm Keith Spira from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. My guest this week on Let's Talk with Keith Spira is singer-songwriter Paul Sanchez. Paul Sanchez, it's been over 30 years since you put out a record called Jet Black and Jealous, and people still love this record. What was the secret of this record? I didn't try. <laughs> well, we will try to have a good interview. Tune in this week on Let's Talk. Louisiana the state we're in goes beyond the headlines to bring you in-depth coverage of the week's news. Whether it's education, health, the economy, or the environment, LPB is your only source for a statewide perspective. Fridays at 7 p.m. on WLAE. Hello, I'm Reynolds Verrett, president of Xavier University of Louisiana. We remain grateful for the generous gifts that support our students in their quest for a more just and humane society. Give Love Xavier Day on April 9th offers the opportunity to donate to Xavier's annual fund, make a vital difference in the lives of our students, and support our areas of greatest need. Please visit givelove.xula.edu to invest in a Xavier student's future. Thank you for your support. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television.